Now let's take our Bibles tonight. Please turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17, we're looking at a series after God's own heart. And tonight we're going to talk about David's courage. 1 Samuel chapter 17. Just before the service, I went around a little bit and I, I surveyed our academy parents and I asked who was ready for school to open. Maybe we'd open school early this week. And not one kid was for it. Can you believe that? And we had one parent that wasn't for it yet. They said, we're not ready for him to go back. And, uh, but I had one parent say, I will pay double tuition if you open tomorrow. And so I thought, well, there we go. So it's getting late in the summer, isn't it? And we're almost ready for that to be over. I, I'm almost ready. My wife and I, we, we enjoy some time, but then we're ready for school to start because it gives the routine back. And it's nice to have that routine throughout the year. 1 Samuel chapter 17, some, some have asked, said, did you enjoy your vacation? We really didn't have a vacation. I'll tell you what we did, because uh, everybody's kind of wondering where we were last week. Uh, we drove, uh, our future daughter-in-law was moving from Michigan to California, so we drove her car from Michigan to California in three days. And so don't, I don't recommend it. It's a long drive. I never knew the United States had so much desert, and some of it's beautiful. And the mountain, you get through the Colorado mountains, and then you get into the, the Red Rock of Utah. But after a thousand miles of Red Rock, you've seen about enough. And it just goes on and on and on. But so last Thursday, we went Thursday evening. We were at my daughter's house in Bay City, Michigan. It was Theo's birthday on Friday. He turned two. And so we had a birthday dinner with them. And Austin and Judy came down, and we loaded her stuff in the back of the West Coast van. And then uh, after supper, we drove to Grand Rapids, Michigan, where we stayed for the night. And we started our trip from Grand Rapids on Friday. And Friday, we drove to Cedar Rapids, Iowa, I think it was. I don't even remember anymore. And then from there, we drove into Moab, Utah. And Moab, Utah is a crater in the ground. I've never seen it like that before. It's like the Grand Canyon, only not so grand. It's very small, and the city is down in this canyon. And it is 120 degrees down in there, and it's just dust and dirt. But there's a great little Baptist church down in there, and we spent Sunday morning in church there. And then we were supposed to be in church Sunday night in Las Vegas, but they were having their connection group night. They weren't having services. So I was kind of thankful because I said to my wife, I don't want to wake up Monday morning. My mom opens her iPad and sees that we're in Las Vegas. I didn't want that because that's where we were going to sleep. And so we just drove right through Las Vegas and went to California because there was no church. And we got there around midnight in California Sunday night. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you this, here's what, here's what struck me about Las Vegas. I've never seen it before. If they could take one of those billboards, those flashing things, and we could use the money for world evangelism. Do you know how much money is in that city? It, it's grotesque. The millions and millions of dollars they spend on bright lights and all the things to glorify sin. And uh, you, I mean, literally several stories high advertising some rock and roll star or some show that's going on. And just, if we could just take that, just a portion of that, the money that is spent in Las Vegas in a day and use that to evangelize or give it to our missionaries. Can you imagine the work that could be accomplished for Christ? Boy, it just really impressed upon my heart driving through there. And I'm glad we just drove right through and we didn't stop. But uh, what, a, what, a, what a place. Be, be in prayer for that city that they'll wake up. Sin City is its nickname. And I think rightfully so. Anyway, 1 Samuel chapter 17. So we drove there. We, got there. we were supposed to get there Monday. We got there Sunday night. And we were thankful for it. That gave us Monday to rest a little bit. And then we got up at 2 in the morning on Tuesday and we flew home. And so we flew to Detroit. We were here by 1 o'clock in the afternoon and we drove home. And so uh, when I was 30, that was no problem. But I'm not 30 anymore, and I'm still reeling from it. So anyway, uh, that's what we did, and we're glad to help them if we can. And so be in prayer for them. Their wedding's next month, and, and uh, we're, we're heading over there, and I think the bakers are going, and the judges are going, and we're going over to a wedding in California. But that'll be a three-day trip, one day there, one day for the wedding, one day back. And uh, we're not driving it, obviously. <laughs> 1 Samuel chapter 17, let's look in verse 20. If we are going to talk about David's courage, where else would we turn but David and Goliath? And so we're going to start there, but I want you to notice and understand something tonight. Courage is so much more important in a spiritual battle than a physical battle. 
And I think you'll see that in the life of David as we progress. And this is a, a great picture of David's courage. It shows us that he was not afraid because God was on his side. But it set him up well for later in life when he had some spiritual battles to fight. And I want you to take that application tonight, if you will. I'm going to dare say that none of you will get up tomorrow morning and have to fight a physical giant. That's not likely to happen. But we will have spiritual battles. And as Brother Roberts has already encouraged us tonight, we need the armor of God. And so let's look tonight at 1 Samuel chapter 17, and we're going to look at the source of this courage, and we will find out where this courage came from, because listen, true courage is not uh, within ourselves. It is something that is God-given. And so look at 1 Samuel chapter 17 tonight, and direct your attention to verse 20. And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep of the keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the uh, trench as the host was going forth to the fight and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle to array army against army. Now understand David's culture was a culture of war. Later in his life, David was called a man of war by God. Therefore, he was not allowed to, to build the temple for the people of Israel and for the habitation of God because there was blood on his hands because God called him a man of war. And so that task was left to his son Solomon. But David grew up in that culture. If we were to go back into the beginning of time, uh, when Israel came into the land of Canaan to begin to conquer, we will see that they lived their lives by fighting battle after battle after battle. A young man growing up in that culture, that's all they would know. I would dare say that if you grew up in Israel today, that might be something that's familiar to you again. It seems like they are always at threat of battle. There's always an attack going on. There's always something about war. And David had become so accustomed to it that he shouted for the battle. This was just a way of life. I imagine that in their hearts they got to the point where perhaps even death wasn't as big a deal to them as it maybe would be to us because they saw it so frequently that they became callous to it or accustomed to it. And so David began to shout for the battle. He was excited about this battle that was going on. In verse 21, for Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words, and David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have ye seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up? And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? And who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him." And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down, and thou mightest see the battle. And David said, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? And he turned from him toward another and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul. And he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. 
David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, go, and the Lord be with thee. And Saul armed David with his armor. He put a helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. And he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had even in a strip, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David. And the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh to the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field." Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine hand from, uh, head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, and all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all the assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And it came to pass when the Philistines arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it, and smote the Philistine in his forehead, that the stone sunk into his forehead. And he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Heavenly Father, help us, Lord, as we examine this passage of Scripture tonight, Lord, and help us to draw from it the source of David's courage. We're going to live in a day and age where we need great courage to be defenders of the faith to stand for truth and right. I pray, Lord, that you'd grant it with your Holy Spirit and help us to understand who we are, but to understand who you are. Lord, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I pray that might be the, the call of the Christian tonight to battle. Help us, Lord, to have courage in this day and age we live. Lord, we need your help, and may the Spirit of God help us tonight. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I think there's no question when we look at the life of David, we, we can see that he had a great courage. Now, we understand this about David even prior to this. The Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 16 that Samuel went to Bethlehem. And there he found the sons of Jesse's, and each one of them came before Samuel, Eliab being the first, from oldest to youngest, and none of them were chosen. And Samuel says, do you have yet another? And he said, yes, he keepeth the sheep. So they sent for David, and when David appeared, immediately Samuel said, Ah, oh, the Lord's anointed. And he anointed him with a horn of oil, and the Bible says at that moment, the Spirit of God came upon David, rested upon him. And so we understand tonight that David's courage came not from his own life, but it came from the Spirit of God that rested upon him. For the next little while and perhaps even years, David would continue to tend to those sheep. And as he tended those sheep, at times he would be called to the side of King Saul, who when, was in a fit of anger. A saddened countenance would need cheering from the harp of David. And so they sent for David. You see, when the Bible says that the Spirit of God rested upon David, it also departed from Saul. And what it did for David, it detracted from Saul. And Saul no longer had that wisdom and that spiritual leadership that he needed. And, and he would go into these fits of anger and rage and at times just a sadness of heart. And, and so David would come and he would cheer him. But that spirit of God that was now upon David intimidated Saul. 
And later in his life, we will see that Saul many times tried to have David killed because he thought he would take his throne. I want you to notice that later on tonight, we will see that that was just not the case at all. David respected God's anointed, and he loved him. But where did this courage come from? Where was this source of courage? And I want you to notice tonight that it's, it's more than just having the Spirit of God. Yes, the Spirit of God rested upon David, and yes, the Spirit of God indwelled David, we see in other passages of Scripture. But I want you to notice something from Scripture tonight. Look at verse 34. As we consider the source of his courage, David had to first realize who he is. He had to understand who he is. Do you know who you are in Christ Jesus? When we think about that, we think about, uh, we think about being children of God, and we think being part of the family of God, and we think about the power of God that can rest upon a believer who is completely surrendered to him, but we also need to understand something about our limitations. We are just human, frail flesh. We are feeble as dust. Our life is but a vapor. And we have no strength unless the Lord Jesus Christ gives us that strength. And so we have to understand that we can do all things through Christ, which strengthens us. So we need that strength, and that's where our courage comes from. Look at verse 34. The Bible says, And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock, and I went out after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing as he hath defied the armies of the living God. Now, if David were to stop there, you'd say, well, what an arrogant young man. Now, I understand he's trying to plead his case, and he's saying to King Saul, let me fight him. I can fight lions, and I can fight bears, and I can smite them, and I can kill them. No problem. I can take care of this, this giant. But look at the next verse. Look what it says. David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine. You see, David could have bragged about all of his achievements, and that would have been impressive, wouldn't it? We don't know how old David is. Many will say he was 14 or 15 years old when he faced Goliath. We have no clue. The Bible does not say. Yeah, do you understand when the Bible's silent, we ought to be silent? Amen. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate that. We have no idea how old David really was. And he could have bragged about these, and we would have been impressed and said, wow, that's incredible, David. I, I don't know about you, but I would have been, I don't know if I'd been much good about facing off with a lion. How about you? Has anybody ever ran into a bear? Some of you guys gone up north, you ever run into a bear? I was, just, I was just reading something this last week, and this, this fellow was at a, a church service, and he had no arm. His arm was, was gone. And when the pastor went, he, just, he was at the door just shaking hands like we do on Sunday. And he was shaking hands, and the man's right arm was gone, and he just didn't know it. And he, first time there, he stuck his hand out, and there was no arm. And he felt kind of embarrassed. You know, he should have noticed, he thought. And as he's reaching, the man just took his left hand and put it in, and he shook his hand with it. And he says, what, what happened? He says, uh, he was thinking cancer or something. He says, he says what, what happened to your arm? Is there something we can pray about in your life? And the man says, well, I had a bit off by a bear. He says, you had a bit off by a bear. He says, yeah. And, and the guy began to tell the story. And the pastor said, it was an awesome story. He says, can you imagine being able to tell the story? I had my arm bit off by a bear. And I thought, that's horrible. I wouldn't want that. But that's kind of sometimes how men think, ladies. I'm going to be honest with you. Man, that is a cool story. Not for the guy that lost his arm. But can you imagine the fear of facing off against a bear or a lion? And David, as a shepherd boy, fiercely stood before them. But he was able to recognize who he was. It wasn't me. It was the Lord that delivered me. It was the Lord that took care of me. But I want you to also notice the second thing we see about David his reliance upon who he is. He recognized who he was, but he was able to rely on who he is. 
that same God that delivered me out of the paw of the bear and the paw of the lion will surely deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine who defies the armies of the living God. You see, that's where true courage comes from. It's when we have a cause. You know, there's such a thing, and we're going to look at this in a moment, there's such a thing as reckless courage. All brawn and no brains. There are some people in this world that are absolutely fearless. And and normally they get themselves in trouble as a result. They run headlong into a fire without thinking about the consequences. But when we have a cause, when we have a cause, then we can have true courage and standing for the right. And David repeated to his brothers over and over, is there not a cause? And when Eliab rebuked him, he turned to others and he rehearsed the matter in the same way and he asked them and he told them the same thing the Bible says. Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? Why is everybody so upset with what I'm about to do? There's a cause and no man's going to defy my God. And so he had courage to stand. The source of that courage is realizing who we are but also understanding who he is. We need humility in this battle. We talked about that this morning a little bit. Listen to what the scripture says. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Listen to this one. But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud but giveth grace unto the humble. You're gonna face some spiritual battles this week And you cannot afford to have God resisting you because of your pride. But you humble yourselves and he'll give you grace. We need to realize who we are, but we need to recognize that our reliance is upon who he is. Trust in him. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. I want to see the source of his courage, but let's look tonight in a very practical way at the steps of his courage. The steps of his courage. Notice verse 26. First thing we see is courage declared. Courage declared. And David spake to the men and stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? And who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? David was able to declare his courage because he knew what he was fighting for. He knew what he was standing for. He says, who is he that would defy the armies of the living God? I would dare say, I, I, I'm, just, I'm just supposing now, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not preaching the Bible right here, I'm just gonna make a supposition and maybe you can think this through with me and help me and see what your conclusion is. I would guess that if Goliath were to step into that valley, and start yelling out, Israel, send me David. That yellow-bellied, lily-livered coward. I have a feeling that David would say, hey, I'm good. No problem. I have a feeling if Goliath stood in that valley and spit in David's face, David had the courage to say, this isn't worth a war over a personal insult. But David had a cause because he defied his God. There's a difference. It's not a big deal to be insulted. I used to know a man who's, I hope, gone to heaven today. Do you ever know people like that? You just hope they went to heaven? Isn't that sad that you don't know? I hope he went to heaven. He had, we, we always used to call it Chihuahua syndrome. You know what a Chihuahua is? It's a dog that's about that big that thinks he's this big. And just barks at everything, right? And that, that was him. And it, it didn't matter what happened. If somebody said, good morning, how are you? He'd say, what do you mean by that? And you just see his shoulders go out. My wife knows exactly who I'm talking about because as soon as he did that, you knew who he was. And he just, this little, and you just wanted to go, go away because you could just blow him over. But he just, he just had that chip on his shoulder and that attitude and that, Listen, that, that's not what a Christian ought to be like. We ought to walk in humility. But hey, when somebody attacks our God, may God give us the courage to stand. 
David declared his courage because they had attacked his God. He said, is there not a cause? Listen, can I, can I say this? Before you go to, to war, before you go to any battle, identify what the wrong is before you try to seek to make something right. Sometimes we go off, we jump on a horse and ride in every direction. Identify what the wrong is first before you try to make it right. And David knew what was wrong, and so he decided to take a stand. It was an offense to his holy God. And then we see courage defined. We see courage defined. As David has declared what he is about to do, we see in verse 28, we see the definition of courage. In verse 28, it says, And Eliab, the eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness in thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. And David said, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? Courage defined, first of all, courage is only courage in spite of the opposition. In spite of the opposition. Eliab accused him of having pride, but David believed there was a cause. There was something worth standing for and something worth fighting for. And understand this today, friend. If you take a stand for God and a stand for right, there will be opposition. But don't worry about it. Well, let me ask you this at the end of the day, whose side do you want to be on? Eliab or God's? Just stand for God and let God take care of the rest. Courage defined is in spite of the opposition, is in spite of the odds. Look at verse 32. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, thou art not able to go against this Philistine. What odds did Saul give David? Zero. Thou art not able. He didn't say, well, you know, David, I think there's a 50-50 chance here you might come back dead. He didn't say that. He said, you are not able to do this. True courage says no matter what the odds... I'm going to fight. I'm going to stand. It doesn't matter if I win or lose. That's not the point. The point is, will I honor my God? And David decided he would honor his God. King Saul opposed his youth and his lack of size and his lack of strength. But listen, David had been doubted before when they called for the king. David was left out in the pasture with the sheep. And all the other brothers were paraded before Samuel first. But finally, it was David. And it was Samuel that made that famous statement, man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looketh upon the heart. He says, don't look at him and judge his size and his strength. God doesn't care a thing about that. He wants a man who's willing to stand. And that was David because of his courage. He had courage in spite of the opposition, courage in spite of the odds, and courage in spite of the obstacles. Look at verse 38. Verse 38. And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put a helmet of brass upon his head, and he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off of him. Now the Bible, I've heard... uh, Hundred preachers preach this passage, and every time they'll say, well, the the armor was just too big for David. Bible doesn't say that. Never says that. I'm going to assume it was. Saul, the son of Kish, was a man who stood head and shoulders above everybody else. And David was a ruddy youth. So I'm going to assume that they were probably right, but the scripture does not say that. The Bible says that David put off the armor because he had not proved it. In other words, he had not tested it. He had never fought with armor before. And so he wanted to go to battle with something he was familiar with. Those are his words. I have not proved it. And so he took five small stones and he put them in a sack. And he took his sling and he went to battle. You see, the world will try to weigh you down as well. And David had courage despite the obstacles placed in front of him. Boy, every, everybody in this story, it seems like, even though they were, some were well-intentioned, everything was designed to stop him from carrying out God's will. But David kept it in sight, is there not a cause? And as a result, he had courage. 
I want you to see something else. Look at verse 40. We've seen courage declared and courage defined. Let me share with you courage displayed. Courage displayed. Have you ever met somebody who all they do is talk a good fight? You ever met somebody like that? They just talk and talk and talk and talk, but they never actually do anything. It's kind of like the Toronto Maple Leafs, right? Yeah, we'll, just, we'll win. We'll, yeah, we're going to stand like, No, you won't. David did a lot of talking. He really did. But when it came time to fight, he went to the battlefield. David spent a lot of time talking, if you think about it. He shouted for the battle. He says, what does the man get who takes the head of this uncircumcised Philistine? Who is he to defy the armies of the living God? When they tried to rebuke him, he said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? When Saul says, you're not able to go, you're too small, you're a ruddy, you're a youth. And he said, oh, but I, I was delivered from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear. And David talked and he talked and he talked. But the time came to battle and David went. That's what true courage is. Listen, we can all watch the news and we can all say, well, this is what needs to happen in our country. How many, how many of you have ever watched the news and you've got all the solutions? Yeah, we all do, don't we? Sometimes we'll, we'll get together and we'll, we'll talk, you know, different men, Dennis and I, we'll, get, we'll talk in the hall and, and, and after we're done talking, we'll say, well, now we've solved all the problems of the world. We've got it all taken care of, all figured out. Truth is, we're good at talking sometimes, but true courage is when we step onto the battlefield and do something about it. Courage must be displayed. Look at verse 40. And he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a scrip. And his sling was in his hands, and he drew near to the Philistine. I suspect that that Philistine didn't look too big when he was standing in the Walmart parking lot. If you look down the road and see a man standing in that parking lot, he doesn't look so big. But the Bible says he drew near to him. He drew near to the Philistine. He got pretty big. All of a sudden, he, he saw him in all of his grandeur. He saw how big he really was. And David still had the courage to stand before him. And the Philistine came out and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest unto me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh to the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. I, I'm going to be honest with you, that would scare me. I'm not afraid of... I'm not afraid of death, but I do not relish the thought of dying. You understand the difference, right? Nobody wants to go, especially when they say you're going to feed your flesh to the fowls of the air. That doesn't sound like a, a, a picnic at the beach. But look what David said to him. Then said David to the Philistine, thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of the hosts and the God of the armies of Israel whom thou hast defied. And I'm thinking, hey, that's great, David, stop right there. But no, David says, I'm going to make him mad too. That's just what you need, an angry giant. Look what he says. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from off from thee, and I will give the carcass of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air, and the wild beasts of the earth, and all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Do you know that their people will spend their lives learning how to do conflict resolution to keep the peace? And David went out on that battlefield, and he did everything that was contrary to that book. He said, I'm going to take the head right off your shoulders. Talk about making a man mad. The odds were against him. Everybody was opposed. He, he had all these things going against him, and yet David went and provoked him because he had courage on display. James 1.22 says, But be doers of the word and not hearers only. Don't talk a good fight, but actually go out and do it. James 4.17, listen to this. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. We have to be more than just a people of, people of word. But we must be also people of action. 
I want you to notice, secondly, or thirdly tonight, the sense of his courage. The sense of his courage. We've seen the source of his courage and the steps of his courage. I want you to see the sense of his courage. I mentioned this earlier. Unbridled courage is simply reckless and foolish. Had David run out on that field to fight a giant just for the fun of it, he would have surely died. But because there was a cause, because he believed that God was being defied and and diminished in the sight of Israel by this uncircumcised Philistine, because there was a purpose behind it, David had a, a sense in his courage. And I want you to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 24. We're going to see the application of his courage a little bit later in his life. 1 Samuel chapter 24. I remember in Bible college one time, we were on the fourth floor of a a school dorm. And there was a fella, we had outside the back door so you could walk all the way down the hall and it was both from here to the back wall and there was apartments on either side and on the back wall, there was a fire door. And outside that fire door, there was a fire escape. And so there were stairs going down, and at nighttime, that door was closed, and an alarm would go off if it opened, and a fire alarm would go off. But during the day, we used it and went in and out and went down those back stairs because it was near the parking lot for the college and such. And one day, one night, I hear, I, I'm, the, I'm the RA on the floor, which is a resident assistant. And I, I hear all this cheering going on. I thought, what's going on? Listen, when you're in a, uh, a floor with 30 guys, cheering is not usually a good thing. It means somebody's about to do something stupid. That's usually what that means. And so if you didn't know that, that's what 19-year-old boys do, okay? And so I was mature. I was 21. So I went out there, and I stuck my head on my door, and I had the room right in the middle of the hallway. And I stuck my head, and I saw this guy come running at me. And he ran right by me, and he ran right out that door, and he jumped right off that balcony from the fourth floor, and he turned in midair and he grabbed that rail and just swung just before he plunged to the ground. Now, if he'd missed that rail, it probably would have killed him. He would have landed on that concrete four stories down. Had he slipped just a little bit, he was likely dead. And everybody cheered and got excited when he did it. And so I wrote him up. I said, You wrote him up? He was just fooling around. No, he was being stupid. He not only put his own life in his hands, he was telling those other guys and daring them to do the same. And dare say, not all of them were as athletic as him, and they were about to try it. And I said, listen, guys, I'm writing him up right now, and I said, I I dare say that if anybody else tries it, you'll get kicked out of this school. I didn't have the authority to kick anybody out. I just wrote him up. But it scared me, and I'm going to be honest, I didn't write anybody up, ever, hardly. Not not a thing. But that scared me. And the guys were cheering on his bravery and his courage. Listen, unbridled courage is stupidity. There was no need for it. But when you have a cause, when you're standing for right, we need biblical courage. We need courage from God. And so there was some sense in David's courage. He had some sense that went along with it. Look at chapter 24 and verse 1. And it came to pass when Saul was returned from following the Philistines that it was told him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all of Israel and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats. And he came to the sheep goats by the way. There was a cave and Saul went in to the cover his feet. And David said, uh, David and his men remained in the sides of the cave. And the men of David said unto him, Behold the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. And David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privily. It came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him because he had cut off Saul's skirt. And he said unto his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master. The Lord's anointed to stretch forth mine hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. So David stayed his servants with the, these words. 
and suffered them not to go against Saul. But Saul rose up out of the cave and went on his way. David also arose afterward and went out of the cave and cried after Saul, saying, My Lord, the king. And when David looked behind him, David stooped with his face in the earth and bowed himself. And David said to Saul, Wherefore hearest thou, wherefore hearest thou the men's words, saying, Behold, David seeketh thy hurt? Behold, this day thine eyes have seen how that the Lord hath delivered thee today into mine hand in the cave, and some bade me kill thee, but I, mine eyes spared thee, and I said, I will not put forth mine hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Moreover, my father, see, yea, the, uh, see the uh, skirt and the robe in my hand, for in that I cut off the skirt of thy robe and killed thee not, Know thou and see that there is neither evil nor transgression in mine hand, and I have not sinned against thee, yet thou huntest my soul to take it. The Lord judge between me and thee, and the Lord avenge me of thee, but mine hand shall not be upon thee. Understand what is going on here. David is hiding in the wilderness of En Gedi, and he finds a cave to hide in. When we were in Israel, Paul, we went to those caves. We, in the wilderness of Engedi, and David would hide in that cave with his mighty men. And the Bible says that Saul turned aside to cover his feet. You say, what does that mean? He was going to the bathroom. So he went into a cave for privacy. And the men in the cave whispered in Dave's ear, David's ear, today God has delivered him into your hand. And David in a moment thought, now is my chance. And when he went up, all of a sudden, he changed his mind. And he cut off just a little bit of the robe of his skirt. I believe to show Saul that he would spare his life. Yes. And as Saul left that cave, David cried out to him. And he held up that piece of fabric. He says, see, God delivered you into my hand, but I would not touch the Lord's anointed. There was some sense in David's courage. You see, Saul was not just some enemy king. Saul was the anointed of God. We have to understand the difference. We can have courage, but biblical courage comes with restraint. It comes with a, a vision. It comes with a cause. We can't, like I said earlier, just get on a horse and ride off in 10 directions. But we must be laser focused on what it is we are standing for. And friend, the only thing we have to stand for is what is found in the word of God. That is the cause. That no man would besmirch Christ. That we would take a stand for him. In 2 Samuel chapter 15 through 19, we won't turn there tonight, our time is gone, but we read about the rebellion of Absalom. Absalom was the son of David who wished to take David's throne. David, who was called a man of war by God, instead chose to leave the city. He said, wait a minute, that's not courage. David understood this. And if you were to read those passages, this is exactly what David said. I have seen what war is like, and half of Jerusalem will be slaughtered if they come into the city and have a war. David had the courage to step aside to save God's people from war. He said, well, that doesn't sound much like courage. Here's what David did. He retreated to a forest and as Absalom's forces came after them, they fought a war, and David won. And Absalom also died. That wasn't David's desire. But in his courage, he showed wisdom. He showed sense. And as he rode off into those woods, he saved hundreds, if not thousands of people living in the city of Jerusalem from the horrors of war. David had fought many battles and he didn't want to see those people go through it. David retreated and regrouped and there God won a great victory. Can I take you to one more passage and we're done. Look at Joshua chapter one. You see, what does this mean for me? I think one of the greatest summary statements for the Christian of where we need to show courage is found in Joshua chapter one. First of all, we need to understand that the source of courage comes from God. Do you remember 
Moses as he was told to go and ask Pharaoh to set God's people free? He was afraid, wasn't he? And so he started making excuses, but I stutter and, I, and I, I, I'm just not going to be respected. And I, 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 how are they going to know that, that you sent me? And God began to dispel every myth. He says, you just open your mouth and I'll put the words in. I'll take care of it. We have to understand that the source of our courage comes from God. And that the steps of our courage, first of all, we need to, uh, we need to define what it is that we are standing for. David declared that there was a cause. And then we see that no matter, once he had a cause in his heart, it didn't matter about the opposition or the odds or the obstacles that were in place, that David was going to step forth and he was going to fight. And then he put it on display by actually going and fighting the giant. He didn't just talk a good fight. But there was wisdom in David's courage we see throughout his life. And you say, how do I employ that today? Here's here's where we employ it today. Look at Joshua chapter 1. Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this shore, and thou and all the people unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given you, as I said unto Moses, from the wilderness in this Lebanon, even under the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and under the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage. There's that word courage. For unto this people thou shalt divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Now listen. In verse 6, he says, be strong and of a good courage to divide the land to the inheritance to all these people from their fathers. Now, you and I look at that and say, well, that's not a big deal. All, all Joshua has to do is get out a map and cut it into 12 pieces. Say, here you go, Zebulun, and here you go, Naphtali, and here you go, Dan, and there's your land. Go and get it. Why does it say he has to have courage? Because in order to do that, they had to fight a lot of battles. There was kings of the Amorites and kings of the uh, Canaanites and on and on, the Perizzites and the Hittites and and, and on and on. They fought battle after battle and blood was shed uh, each and every day as they settled the land of Canaan. So God said to Joshua, be strong and of a good courage. He said, well, that doesn't apply to me. Probably not. I don't know that God's going to ask you to go into a land and divide it up for an inheritance and fight battles. But the next verse does. Look at verse 7. Only be thou strong and very courageous. Which one carries more weight? Be strong and of a good courage or be thou strong and very courageous? Very courageous. To do what? That thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou may prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart of thy mouth. Thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have I not commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Do you know what we need courage in today? Just obeying the book. You say, well, that's no big deal. I read it and I'll do it. There'll be opposition. I can guarantee if you covenant tonight that I'm going to obey to do whatever's in the word of God, there'll be opposition tomorrow. Somebody will stand against you. Somebody will mock your Christianity. Somebody will challenge you on an issue. It's amazing how the mind of our nation has changed. You'll hear people say, well, I can't believe they're trying to take abortion rights away. I can't believe they ever gave anybody a right in the first place to do an abortion. Yet to say it, to stand on the word of God, you'll be mocked. And you'll be in the minority. Only be strong and very courageous to observe, to do 
all that is in the law. Meditate therein day and night. You say, why do I need to meditate? So you don't forget it. That it's constantly in your heart. You're constantly striving. What does the word say? What does the Bible say? What does God say about this? And then go out and do it. Don't just say it, but follow through. Don't be a hearer only, but also a doer of the word. Be courageous. Heavenly Father, help us, we pray, to be a courageous people. The word of God is foreign in this day and age. They look at all their science. They look at all the books in their library. They look at all the history, the learning, and all the advances that we've made. And they compare it to the one book I hold in my hand. And they say, why should I believe that? Because our book comes from God. And Lord, it is God's holy word. And help us to be strong and very courageous to do everything we find within its covers. To obey it. Lord, it's so much easier to say than it is to do, but help us to have the courage to follow, in, uh, follow through in this world that, is, that has gone far beyond what we ever ma- imagined. Help us to stand for right and earnestly contend for the faith. And Father, we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Let's stand tonight. Would you commit to that tonight? You say, well, I, I've committed, commit again. Ask the Lord again for that courage to do what's right, to stand. Young people, I was teasing you about going back to school, but the truth is, you're going to be going back to school real soon, and you have, you're going to go, some of you are going into a public school where, boy, their agenda is very different than the house of God. You're going to need courage. You're going to need God's people praying for you. Some of you are going off into a godless workplace tomorrow. You're going to need courage to stand. Would that we'd have the courage of David, given by God, but not just talked about, actually displayed in his life. God help us. I have decided to follow Jesus. If that's your prayer tonight, do business with God before you leave this place.